You're listening to the Hayek Program Podcast. This podcast includes audio from lectures, interviews, and discussions from scholars and visitors of the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. To learn more about the Hayek Program, visit hayek.mercatus.org. To learn about graduate student fellowship opportunities with the Mercatus Center at George Mason University for students at Mason as well as at universities across the globe, please visit students.mercatus.org. Welcome to the Hayek Program podcast. I'm Rosalino Candela, a senior fellow with the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University and Associate Director of Academic Programs here at the Mercatus Center. I'm joined today by Dr. Douglas Rasmussen and Dr. Douglas Denial. Uh, Dr. Rasmussen is a professor of philosophy um, at St. John's University in Queens, New York. And Dr. Denial is vice president of educational programs at Liberty Fund. And welcome. Thank you. Thank you. This is a particular pleasure for me because I was an undergraduate student of, uh, of Doug, Doug Rasmussen, and I should say that I've learned so much from, from your joint work together, and which is what we're going to be talking about today, your books and articles that you've written together. Um, which brings me to the first question I wanted to talk to you about is, um, you, the two of you together are known as the Dugs. And I just wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about how it is that you came to uh, work together professionally uh, and so on and so forth in writing your articles. How is it that you first met? And what was it that sparked your joint interest in, in your ideas? Well, we met a long time ago, probably longer than uh, I would want to admit. Um, but uh, I was in grad school in Chicago. Doug was in grad school in Milwaukee. We had a mutual interest in libertarianism, Ayn Rand, things like that. And um, I believe Doug was putting on a conference in Milwaukee, and we had heard of each other uh, through Tibor McCann, maybe. I uh, can't remember. And, and Doug invited me to come, and that was really the first time we associated uh, together. Uh, at that time, I was looking for a graduate school to go to after Chicago uh, for various reasons. And Marquette, uh, where Doug was, was interested in uh, having me. Uh, and so um, we ended up in grad school together. So uh, that's sort of the early history. I'll let Doug uh, go on from there. But uh, we, we, that's where we started. Yeah, we started in grad school together. And we uh, saw, we took different courses, but we'd always talk about different articles, different books. We ran other, col uh, other seminars and colloquia at Marquette. We also uh, did some seminars and colloquia uh, in, uh, in Michigan. Uh, near Doug's uh, summer home at that time. Uh, we had people like John Hospers uh, who would participate in these and a lot of other current uh, sort of philosophical economic libertarians. Uh, Gene Smiley, who some of you may, may know, was at that time at Marquette University. Uh, he would participate. And there were, it was a qu quite a group of people. Uh, we started writing together uh, when uh, we saw an article in the University of Southern California Journal, The Personalist, um, and an article was written by Robert Nozick, and the title of the article was On the Randian Argument. And we thought that Nozick uh, had, of course, written a very good article, and he was critical of Rand, but we also thought that the article showed an insufficient appreciation for how an Aristotelian would think about ethics, and we proceeded to write an article called Nozick on the Randian argument, where we uh, begged to differ with uh, Professor Nozick on certain things, and it, 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 we succeeded. And uh, from that, we went on to uh, do other things. I think our first book we did together was the, a book called The Philosophic Thought of Ayn Rand, which was not meant to be uh, something that would just praise Rand, but something that would critically but fairly consider her arguments. And we had uh, an array of people from people like uh, Wallace Matson from the University of California, Berkeley, who was quite a philosopher, to the English philosopher Anthony Flew, uh, people like Eric Mack uh, and uh, Tibor McCann participated, and, and, and there were others. And Doug and I provided uh, 
a introductory uh, chapter to each of the main sections of the book, and so that that got us going, and uh, we we kept on pursuing our own uh, our own work at the same time, and of course trying to find our way in academe. Now I know each of you, besides studying philosophy as undergraduates, if, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Doug Denial. Uh, you were also a political science major, and Doug Rasmussen, you were a major in economics as well. But why is it that you decided professionally you would pursue philosophy as your academic career? Uh, well, I sort of didn't decide at first because I went to Chicago in political science, not in philosophy. And then I realized I didn't want to have an academic career in political science for various reasons, looked into their philosophy department, I knew I wanted to do a historical thesis, and uh, that's when Doug mentioned Marquette as a good place to go. So I left there and then entered philosophy from political science. So I knew I wanted to do mainly political social theory from a historical perspective, at least at the dissertation stage. So that was, that was my sort of history. Yeah, I did my undergraduate work at the University of Iowa. Uh, and I majored in philosophy and economics. Uh, the philosophy department at Iowa is, was unusual in the sense it was highly analytic, but also very ontological. In other words, the great and classic questions of philosophy were done, but from an ontological perspective. Um, so anyway, I was there, and I was majoring in economics as well. And I, I guess the nice way or the quick way of saying why I ended up being in philosophy is I'm sitting in my advanced microeconomics class, and they're trying to explain to me why the wheat farmer has no effect on the price. Uh, and, and so the, the curve is perfectly flat. And uh, I'm saying, but wait, the market curve is supposed to be sloped, and the summation of the, of, the, of, of, of the individual curves gives me a slope. But if it's flat, how do you get some, some slope into it? And I kept on, kept on asking the question. And finally, the econ professor looked at me and he says, what are you, a philosopher? <laughs> and that's, that, that's how I said, well, maybe questions of methodology, questions of abstraction, uh, how, we have, how we form concepts were crucial. And the reason I mentioned the ontological character of the philosophy department at Iowa was because the sorts of questions about what is it in reality to which our concepts refer and all those sort of classic questions were considered a part of one's philosophical education. So my own orientation uh, went into looking at questions about the, uh, the nature of what logic is about, concept formation and abstraction, and that's what my dissertation was on. Uh, so that's, that's how, how I got into philosophy, I guess. So correct me if I'm wrong, but um, the two of you sort of came of age, professionally speaking, right around the time when uh, Rawls' The Theory of Justice came out and Anarchy State and Utopia by Robert Nozick had come out. Can you talk a little bit about how that had affected your your uh, research interest and what type of philosopher or what type of uh, topics of specialization that you pursued, how what ideas you had before then, and how those two publications, what effect did it have um, in the field of philosophy and how it affected the trajectory of your career? Well, um, uh, Doug will add, add, add to this uh, if he needs to, but um, I think both of us were interested sort of in an Aristotelian tradition, uh, partly through the influence of Ayn Rand. Uh, we were also sort of committed to a kind of libertarian uh, political philosophy. And I, I think we both would agree that Nozick's book, Anarchy, State, Utopia, really put, made it legitimate uh, to come out and, and be a libertarian. It took a while after that for that to happen. but. Uh, that motivated us to see if we can work within the libertarian uh, framework from an Aristotelian uh, point of view. And I think, um, uh, you know, Doug and I managed to be one of the few people that were committed to that program, which is probably why we started out, you know, sort of working well together, and then we sort of me meshed into a, a pattern of working that we've continued to this day. Um, but I think Nozick had, uh, had an important uh, influence. Rawls um, became sort of the um, uh, darling of political philosophy. And I think we were motivated by offering an alternative to the kind of way Rawls did things. I mean, some of what Rawls did was, was fine and interesting. We're, we're not condemning the whole thing. But we had a different project, and, and we thought that we could pursue that project at the same time. I don't know what you want to No, I think that's fine. I think that's by and large what we did. Can you talk a little bit about any 
particular influences that you had at, at the time? For example, were there other scholars uh, that, uh, that were uh, working at that time that had an impact in your career that, were, that shared the same ideas and that motivated uh, where you were? I mean, you had mentioned Aristotle, of course. You mentioned Ayn Rand. Were there other figures uh, at that time um, that were played an influence, not only played an influence in, in your career, but also um, uh, motivated you in your interests? Well, uh, we certainly have to say that the Aristotelian, neo Aristotelian philosopher Henry Babcock Veach made a tremendous difference to how we would approach ethics and even how we would understand Aristotelian ethics. And uh, he influenced us uh, tremendously. Uh, Henry was, Veach was never a libertarian or a classical liberal, but he almost became one, I think is fair enough, by the time we worked on him for about 20 <laughs> years. Uh, but uh, Henry, uh, Henry got us to see philosophy in a very fundamental light and, and how to how to, in a way, find the principles that are in at work, uh, even though things are very complicated, and how to see it. So, so, so we each had a tremendous influence, and we, you know, uh, we just did a book. It wasn't a book; it was an article for the Liberty Fund, uh, Law and Liberty, on an Aristotelian radical, recalling something about Veach's work and how it was important to us. Uh, a little bit later, along the way, uh, there was a guy that wrote a book called Personal Destinies. His name was David Norton. And I'll let Doug say something about how important David Norton was. Well, <clears throat> uh, he was extremely important to, uh, to both of us. Uh, we knew him personally, like we knew Henry Veach. Uh, uh, he unfortunately died very young, but the Personal Destinies book, I think we both have marked up. If you look at really our first sort of solo um, Discourse, uh, Liberty and Nature book, uh, you'll see a lot of David Norton in there, and we refer to him quite often, take up some of his examples. I think he opened us uh, to really understanding Aristotelianism uh, in a sort of non-analytic way. Uh, I think he brought, brought home to us um, a kind of Aristotelianism that I think is more true to Aristotle than what you got quite often from analytic philosophers. And in that regard, he's really very fundamental, I think, to uh, to what we've uh, what we've done over the years. Um, one other thing about Henry, I think, uh, he was a gracious man to the two of us. Uh, we would be at conferences, and uh, we were just grad students, and he'd hang out with us as opposed to other faculty members and so forth. So really, uh, that sort of attention really helps uh, develop relationships. And he was a remarkable man. I think we both would agree. All right, so I want to just switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about the joint work that you've done together. Uh, but before we delve into the details of literally over three decades of published work you've done together, a series of articles, books, Liberty and Nature, Liber Liberalism Defended, Norms of Liberty, The Perfectionist Term, and what we'll talk about in a moment, uh, your next book, The Realist Term. Uh, but just very briefly, can you talk a little bit about how you understand political, not only political philosophy, but classical liberalism. I, I oftentimes hear classical liberalism as a, as a worldview, as an ethics, as a political philosophy. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I'm one of the first things we say about this is, of course, is that classical liberalism is a political philosophy. Uh, it's not a metaphysics. It's not a worldview. Uh, it's not even an ethics. Uh, it's a question about uh, what uh, ought to be the aim of the political legal order and what is the nature of the connection between the ethical order and the political legal order. And it has certain theories about that. Now, the type of classical liberalism that Doug and I are interested in primarily is, of course, a, a classical liberalism that flows from a understanding of the individual human being having the natural rights, the negative basic natural rights to life, liberty, and property. And these are principles uh, that set the context in which people might have the possibility of pursuing a worthwhile life. And that this, 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 type, of, this type of politics 
is radically different from the types of politics that we see prior to modernity. Uh, I, those people who have looked at some of the stuff that Doug and I have written, they probably know the phrase, uh, we, we like to say that statecraft is not soulcraft, that the purpose of the political legal order is, is not uh, to make us moral, whether that is to be understood in a left wing or a right wing or whatever manner it is. And that, so there's something unique about the classical liberal tradition. Not that the classical liberal tradition always understood this or always got it coherently uh, addressed, but that, that's, that, that's how I think we, we approach classical liberalism and why we think it's important. Yeah, I don't have anything to add to that. I think it's a pretty good summary of what, what we're all about. Great. Can you talk a little bit about your current book project that you're wor working on together? And more importantly, how is it that the current questions that you're dealing with in that book, how did, it, how did that evolve from the previous works that you had done together? I had mentioned the books that had, you had co-authored together. What was it that in the evolution of the, the statement of the principles that you are outlined all the way back going from the philosophic thought of Ayn Rand to liberty in nature. How is it that the, the questions that you're that you're want that you're picking up on in the realist turn, how did they evolve from those previous projects? Well, <clears throat> it probably will surprise a lot of people. There's an Aristotelian phrase that first in the order of knowledge, last in the order of being. Doug and I have always been interested in the metaphysics and epistemology of the Aristotelian tradition. It's just that our publications up to this point got caught up in politics, political philosophy, ethics, and so forth, which is, which is great. But in the back of our minds, I think for probably since we started working together, this was the book we were working towards in a way. We wanted to have uh, get to this point where we felt comfortable enough to try to show the connections between uh, the stuff we had done earlier and, and why this basic background is, is necessary for... Uh, so we're, we're finally getting to the order of being, if you will, uh, in terms of the, what we think is fundamental uh, sure. to, uh, to even political philosophy and so forth. I think that's always motivated us, and we've finally gotten to a point where we can try to tackle that a bit. I'll let Doug add a few things. Yeah, I, I suppose uh, what's crucial to uh, our approach to both ethics and uh, norm uh, perfectionist ethics and grounding natural rights is our rejection of the idea that all moral norms are of the same type or same kind. They all have the same function. And so the, a way of, the concept of a right would work would be the same way as a concept of a virtue would work. And we want to say, no, they have different functions, and how they operate is crucially different. But in, in current moral thought, generally speaking, as it is expressed in most utilitarian and Kantian ethics, tends to flatten all norms into, into one single type. And we think the cause of this is primarily the idea that moral norms are constructed out of either human thought or human practices or both. And we think that one of the ways of being able to appreciate rights and indeed uh, perfectionism is to understand that there has to be a basis in reality for our, our, our ethical judgments and even ultimately our political ones. And so we need to hearken back to human nature how, how to understand human nature, uh, how it works, and this will allow us to see uh, some of the differences between the, the types of, of norms or principles that, that, that are at work. And so uh, we've been moving, as Doug was said, uh, from this, uh, from uh, a general political philosophy to this more ontological or metaphysical uh, point of view for years. And that's now we're just trying to uh, uh, not only clarify how important realism is to the, uh, are the defense of natural rights, but how uh, realism uh, of the kind uh, that we're talking about, namely that there, there's a reality and, and we don't make it up and we can know it, that that's crucial uh, to uh, uh, so much of our knowledge. And so it's, it, we're, in a way, we're defending a fairly classical view. Now, since this is called the Hayek Program podcast, I want to switch gears and, and ask you the following. So, uh, Doug, I, as I said before, uh, it feels like a long time ago now. It feels like a, both a long time ago, but just, just yesterday I was in your classroom, and I do remember reading Personal Destinies. I do remember reading uh, Man's Rights by Ayn Rand, and these were things that completely fascinated me about the role of property rights, not only for free society, but for also for a market economy. 
But slowly but surely, I also became fascinated uh, with the Austrian school. And, but it was reading from your joint, it was from reading your joint work that I became really intrigued by what I saw, what I saw, I don't know if this is the case, but hopefully you could shed some light on parallel insights that we see in the Aristotelian ethical tradition and the Austrian tradition of seeing the market as a process of entrepreneurial discovery. And what overlap, if any, do you th think exists between those two, tra two traditions? Do they mutually reinforce each other and can they learn from each other? Uh, I think they uh, are not necessarily in conflict. And I think they can be mutually supportive. Uh, one of the first things to realize is that when Hayek, in his essay, The Use of Knowledge in Society, wants to contend that the type of knowledge that's necessary for the coordination of everything to work is a knowledge that is uh, localized, knowledge that changes, that is particular and contingent, that type of knowledge is crucial for, the mar for, for markets to work. And interestingly enough, that's, there's always been a parallel between emphasizing that kind of knowledge and the Aristotelian claim that in putting together a worthwhile life, a virtuous life, a morally excellent life, you have to have a way of taking the normative principles and making them uh, concrete in a way that's appropriate for you as the person you are. He calls this the doctrine of the mean. And this requires insight into the contingent and particular. And he calls the excellent use of this insight, he calls this practical wisdom. So there's an interesting parallel uh, between those two. And uh, I think uh, we've said something about this in our latest book, The Perfectionist Turn, that Doug might want to say something about. A little more generally in the sense that I think what appealed to both of us early on before we were even that knowledgeable was that Austrian economics allowed for purposeful conduct. And, and that to me was central to the, any connection that you could get between the Aristotelian tradition and an economic approach or philosophy. And then the more we looked into it, I think the things that Doug just mentioned uh, helped, but also uh, how markets work seemed to be uh, less a rational construction and, and more a function of how people actually behave and, and uh, what they're trying to get from, from their own lives and so forth. And that seemed to fit the Aristotelian uh, framework as well, even though I guess, you know, Mises was more a Kantian than an Aristotelian. Still, uh, I think there were things about what he did that, that uh, and Hayek as well, uh, that, that fit that tradition. When you speak to classical liberals, they usually fall into two camps, you might say, or two paradigms by which they defend the rules that structure a classical liberal, classical liberal legal and political order. That is, they usually defend the rules based on a consequentialist line or a deontological line. But from your works, it seems that there's an alternative way to think about justifying the rules that transcends both paradigms. Can you talk a little bit about what we mean by consequentialism or uh, uh, rules that are defended based on a deontology and how your work seems to transcend those, or suggest that we can transcend those lines based upon defending natural rights based on a neo-Aristotelian account of human flourishing? Well, I'm, I'm, there's, it's a complicated question. I think in general it's, it's the case that we want to devoid, uh, avoid that dichotomy between consequentialism and deontology if we possibly can. Uh, the problem, of course, is that everybody wants to categorize things in, in, in one or the other. And I, I suspect what we'd say, and maybe what motivates us, Doug can uh, say more about this, is that um, both of those sort of ignore the idea that there are natures and essences and things that uh, are part of reality, so that they either boil it down to sort of kind of rationalist process or a kind of, um, what, would, what would we want to say, a kind of uh, empirical uh, process, whereas in the Aristotelian tradition, those have a very strong relationship with each other together, not not choosing between one or the other, that you can't un understand the empirical without the rational, and the rational is dependent upon the empirical and so forth. So that for us, 
those kinds of dichotomies are always generally very suspicious, and, and we try to, uh, we've tried to stay away from them and show ways around them if we possibly can. Yeah, we tend to uh, say more about uh, the idea that the human good is not just a state of affairs, not just a state of being, but also an activity. And so when we're talking about the good, we're also talking about the right activity. And so there's, there's something already uh, gone astray in assuming that we can talk about the good apart from the activities that constitute the achievement of the good. Uh, again, the, the, being a good Aristotelian, we'd want to say what is distinct is not separable. And, and, and that's one of, the, one of the problems that's going on here. But Doug was right, right on to note that as Aristotelians, we think that things have natures. And so a principle can identify certain things about the, a nature of something or a nature of a problem. So when we go to thinking about moral concepts and what they're about, we have to be realistic about that. We have to ask, what is the problem, what is the issue that the moral principle is addressing? Is it addressing human flourishing? Is it addressing how to live uh, my life among others in a way that's compatible with everyone being able to have the chance to do that? And there's, again, different functions, different things that, that, that come about. But it's always to the nature of things and that nature could be understood as nature of the individual, uh, the nature of, of the particular context or circumstance, the nature of sociality. I mean, one of the things we like to emphasize here, and I've done, done this for years, is that it, we like to always say that individualism is not atomism, that we have to understand that uh, when we start talking about the basis for, for things, we have to understand our natural sociality. So that's a part of it, too. I just should add that. So before we wrap up, um, I wanted to close by asking you a question. Given that we've talked a lot about your joint work together, your joint collaboration together, uh, academically speaking, what is it that you're currently working on um, that's interesting you independently of the joint work that you've been doing together? Well, I've been doing a lot with Adam Smith uh, quite a bit. Um, uh, just did a paper on Oakshot. Um, uh, I'm still trying to work uh, as best I can on Shaftesbury. So I have a number of historical figures, uh, Spinoza as well, that I've spent some time on that are, are independent of uh, the joint work. Although, um, you know, even there we did a piece not so long ago on Spinoza and Aquinas uh, together. So uh, we do, even when we're doing our separate work, I think we still uh, trade information and, and uh uh, commentary and advice and uh, help uh, on, on even the stuff that, that's separate. But uh, I think when we're not working on our stuff, I tend to uh, explore individuals mainly and individual thinkers and work on that basis. Well, Doug's right that what we do uh, apart from one another usually in involves dealing with one another quite a bit. <laughs> so so I, I, th I think that's right. Uh, my uh, uh, intellectual orientation has always been towards certain philosophical problems, philosophical problems that I find addressed best in the Aristotelian to mystic tradition. So I've spent a lot of time looking not only at Aristotle but Aquinas, in particular the to mystic uh, tradition. I've done a lot of work uh, on the question of what makes something a necessary truth, arguing against the purely formal linguistic accounts of necessary truth but also are trying to avoid the idea that all, all necessary truths are just empirical generalizations. Um, so I've written, and, and this has also got into some research on alternative paradigms to what we take induction to be or not. So, that, so, so this, this is some interesting stuff. Uh, I should also say, though, when, start, when I start talking about grounding necessary truths, it, it leads me to a current project that I'm dealing with. I've always been fascinated by an early article by Murray Rothbard called In Defense of Extreme A Priorism, which, if you remember to look at the title, the words extreme a priorism are in scare quotes. And Rothbard argues, the, argues that these truths are at once uh, empirical and yet necessary. And at the time when he wrote that, uh, that was almost unintelligible to most people. And uh, since then, we've learned a lot more about it. And uh, we've learned that there's a possibility that the words a priori and the words necessary are not, nece are not necessarily the same. And that, indeed, we can talk about uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the action axiom, to use Rothbard's terminology, as being both a necessary truth and an empirical one. And I'm writing a paper on that right now, which is exploring uh, this tradition uh, of thought. 
Well, I want to thank you very much for your time. This has been, it's been a great conversation. It's been a great privilege for me to be able to talk to the both of you. And I want to thank uh, those of you listening for joining us in this high program podcast. Thank you for listening to the Hayek Program Podcast. To learn more about the research, scholars, and work of the Hayek Program, visit hayek.mercatus.org. For more information about graduate student fellowship opportunities for students at Mason as well as at universities across the globe, please visit students.mercatus.org. We hope you recommend students to our programs or consider applying yourself.